Medes is a Harvard Business School Senior Lecturer of Business Administration, and he was a managing partner at the Center for Executive Development, a firm that won awards in the United States and in Europe for its work with companies. He has consulted to many companies is affiliated with PE and VC investors and has been a board member of Austral, Evenflow, Growth Play, Halo Industries, Startup Firms, and the Education for Employment Foundation. At Harvard, he teaches entrepreneur sales and marketing, heads the executive program on linking strategy and sales, and teaches in the owner president management program for CEOs. Frank has written for many publications, including Harvard Business Review, California Management Review, Organization Science, and the Wall Street Journal. And he is an author of six books. His newest book is Sales Management that works how to sell in a world that never stops changing. The book is available on our website at speakersalliance.ca. Frank, welcome to the Speaker Corner, where our audience will find the interview series with our speakers and business consultants, and thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Gwen. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. It's my pleasure. Frank, let's start the conversation with your newly published book. So why did you write Sales Management That Works, and what were your motivations? Well, thank you for asking. Here's a uh, copy uh, of the book, the cover. Um, I had two uh, major motivations uh, in writing this book. The first is um, uh, my motivation as someone who has studied and worked with companies on this topic uh, for almost 30 years now. Um, the reality is that of all the major business functions, sales is the most context dependent, right? right? It differs by product. Selling software is different than selling capital goods, is different than selling professional services. Uh, selling enterprise software is different than selling software as a service. It differs by where and to whom you're selling. Selling in North America is different than selling in South America, Europe, Asia, and so on. And yet, of all the business functions, sales is the area where people feel most comfortable making these huge generalizations that are usually unsupported by any empirical data whatsoever. So the, the, the first motivation was simply, look, I want to tell you what research does and doesn't say about selling. Mm -hmm. The second motivation is that I think this is a, a particularly good time uh, for a book on this topic for a couple of reasons. One is there is no doubt whatsoever that digital technologies and the data revolution are affecting selling and buying. Right. But my reading of most of what's written about that is that it simply misunderstands the impact of technology on selling. And of course, the pandemic itself is quite rightly uh, motivating people to rethink the way they um, conduct their sales, marketing, and business development activities. So it looks like I have to get a copy of your book. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> because it, it sounds very interesting. Can you provide a brief overview of the key topics and messages in the book? Yeah. Um, well, first, let me start with one of the important messages and why um, understanding the difference between fact and hype in this area matters. And it matters because it affects one of the key things that any business executive has to do, and that is allocate resources. And if you don't separate fact from hype in this area, you're, you're gonna do a few bad things. You're gonna make either bad or suboptimal decisions mm -hmm. based on the wrong assumptions about a market. Um, you can worry all you want about disruption and other things, but at the end of the day in business, you need a relevant go-to-market 
in order to do something about disruption. And then finally, in any competitive market, if you don't separate fact from hype, uh, you will inevitably fall victim to those who do understand those mm -hmm. links. Now, a couple of things about the book. The basic point of the book is that the most important thing about selling is buying. Not the salesperson, but the buying. Who buys, why, and how. And that is where technology is having its biggest impact. I'm going to get academic just for a moment, but if you look at sales around the world, most sales models are based on what academics call a hierarchy of effects model. In other mm -hmm. words, a pipeline where you try to move a prospect from awareness to interest, to desire, to action. AIDA, it's known as AIDA, you know, like the opera. Mm -hmm. um, that's an inside out process that is increasingly irrelevant to the way people buy. We're now in an omni-channel buying world where prospects are both online and offline at multiple times throughout their buying journey. Right. And that's a big deal because it affects some core areas of business development and sales management in particular. It affects people. It affects hiring criteria, training, et cetera. You know, there are, there are and always have been challenges in sales hiring that really don't exist in most other functions. Uh, if you want to, for example, hire an engineer, you can go to an engineering school and it's a little bit like walking into a buffet. What, what, what are you interested in? Electrical engineering, chemical engineering, and so on. Mm -hmm. If you need people to work in finance or accounting, you can find people who major in those subjects. The same is true for computer programming. But of the nearly 5,000 colleges and universities in the United States and Canada, less than 200 even have a sales course, let alone a sales program. So the vast majority of, of uh, salespeople begin their careers with no preparation whatsoever. Right. And that affects training. Companies already spend per capita 20% more on sales training than on any other business function. But the return on investment from that money is, is very disappointing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the changes I've talked about affect sales models. Uh, many sales models, as I explained, are really based on uh, obsolete uh, assumptions and it affects what you do in a sales model, the way you pay people, the way you deploy people. For example, I think one of the things that the pandemic has demonstrated to many companies is that in effect, they were overpaying for certain areas of their sales models, lead generation, demos, you can do a number of them online, many meetings you can do online. Mm -hmm. And that is true as buying changes. Uh, it affects pricing. Uh, it, uh, there are now many, many more ways to test prices and pricing, but uh, many companies display surprising inertia in this area. It affects partners. In an omni-channel buying world, you need a multi-channel selling effort. And that's, that's a significant change. I mean, just as an example, whenever a salesperson has to work with channel partners, the individual contributor, which is what most salespeople are, must also become a manager. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the infamously difficult transition for salespeople. And then finally, and this is in many ways what the book is about, it affects sales productivity, how to achieve productivity, but also in service dominated economies, Canada, the United States, most other countries, selling uh, is a fundamental part of economic growth and productivity. And that is a social responsibility of managers, not only a responsibility to increase profits. So it's got a, it's got a lot 
of implications. Mm -hmm. Frank, who would be the most relevant audience for this book and any speeches based on issues discussed in the book? Well, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, sales, marketing, service, business development groups in general are, you know, a core audience uh, for a book like that. And I've always been because of uh, the other books I've written, my research, the business I ran. I've always been a, a frequent keynote speaker at uh, conferences and meetings uh, about those groups. But I also want to point out a few others, and, and you'll see this discussed in the book. Uh, finance groups and investors. Uh, one of the things that's going on with the data revolution is that the data about sales is becoming much more transparent to finance groups and companies and to investors. And when they see the data, their first response, in my experience, is holy mackerel. We had no idea how much money we were spending on that, and we need to look at it a bit more rigorously. So I'm now increasingly asked uh, to talk to groups like that. But I also believe, and this is really what the final uh, chapter of the book is about, and by the way, a uh, Harvard Business Review article I've written that should come out next month, mm -hmm. this is also relevant to leadership teams. Um, because of my previous book, uh, Aligning Strategy in Sales, because of the company I ran, uh, I've probably been part of as many strategy meetings <laughs> as anyone, mm -hmm. uh, certainly as many as anyone at Harvard Business School. And the reality, this is simply the data, the reality is that more people than ever before have made it to the so-called C-suite in companies without any previous experience in sales or marketing. So there is an increasingly big gap between the C-suite, including the CEO, and what does and doesn't really happen in their sales groups. And, and you know, that's another uh, audience that is relevant for the book uh, and potentially uh, speaking engagements, Glenn. So Frank, can you say more about experience with speaking to various groups and the kinds of topics, contacts, and events? Well, I mean, I've, uh, uh, over the course of my career, uh, and you know, it's, the number is somewhere in the hundreds, what, what I would call traditional uh, speaking engagements, mm -hmm. the speaker at the conference, or the uh, speaker at the kickoff meeting, uh, et cetera. But in my case, that is often, not always, mm -hmm. I'm often asked to do that in conjunction with some workshop or some other training uh, educational event that the company wants for their executives or their sales managers or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would say at least half the um, uh, speaking engagements I've had in my career are of that sort. There's a speech, but then there's also, Frank, can you spend a day working with the relevant people, teach a case study, run a workshop, that sort of thing. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that a lot. In terms of the topics, the best thing I can say, uh, Gwen, for our audience is the topics range from sales, marketing, pricing, uh, but again, also strategy, and in my case, uh, particularly strategy implementation, as well as a variety of leadership topics. I've written about all these things, and I've been lucky enough mm -hmm. that um, you know a number of people have actually noticed what I've written and often give me a call about it. Frank, it is a very challenging time for everyone. How has the pandemic affected your speaking engagements or the issues discussed in the book? Well, um, the, the question about the speaking engagements is an interesting one. And uh, let, me, let me give you the history briefly. I remember this very vividly because last year, 2020, was a leap year. 
Mm -hmm. And on February 29th, I was the keynote speaker at a pretty big user conference for a tech company out on the West Coast. There must have been at least 1,200 people at this conference, mm -hmm. no social distancing. People were talking vaguely about this virus in China. Ten days later, my institution, Harvard University and most others, shut down. So it was very, very sudden. Within two weeks after that, every speaking engagement that I had on my calendar for 2020, both in the United States and internationally, for obvious reasons, was canceled. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's it. And then, much to my pleasant surprise, uh, the virtual sessions, you know, via Zoom or WebEx or whatever, uh, did uh, begin to happen. And I've probably done one per month uh, over uh, the past year since last March. And I enjoy it. I think I think it's I think it's gone over well. Uh, you know, the the test of this is does the company ask you to do it again and you know, that's been the case with virtually every one. And speaking for myself, I don't miss airplane travel. <laughs> and uh, it, this is very convenient. I've done the majority of these sessions either here in my home office or in my office uh, at Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, the uh, impact of the pandemic on the book, some of this is actually discussed in the book. But it has made the book more relevant than ever for a couple of reasons. Right. One is what the pandemic has done is raise the stakes for getting it right. It has raised the stakes for separating fact from hype. Uh, and again, I talk a little bit about this in the book, but you know, daily, I'm sure you're getting these um, emails and articles just as I do. Daily, you have all of these predictions about so-called new normals. Right. And the vast majority of them, and by vast majority, I mean your body temperature, 98.6% are nonsense. They're just straight line extrapolations of what happens when there are lockdown conditions and people are afraid to go into a store for obvious reasons. Right. right? Uh, so it has raised the stakes for getting that right or wrong. And secondly, it's a good topic uh, because of the pandemic. Um, most companies are facing big business development cha uh, challenges in order to recover from the pandemic. And, you know, that is what the, uh, the book is about. So I've been pleasantly surprised uh, by the um, and I'm a little reluctant to say this because this is uh, this is this has been an economic catastrophe. We are in services dominated economies. The pandemic is not an equal opportunity plague. Mm -hmm. It especially hurts services businesses. But I have been, for whatever reason, very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much, Frank, for sharing further information regarding your newly published book and your um, topics. Frank's book is available on our website at speakersalliance.ca. And honestly, Frank, I'm going to order the book right now after our conversation. So thank you for the overview and have a nice rest of the day. Gwen, you don't have to order it. I'll send you a copy. And I want to thank you very much for taking the time to do oh, it. Oh, it will be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> thank you, Frank. Bye.